All right, fourth lecture here for chapter 19. We're going to talk a little bit more about veins. And um, I do want to point out for you that it's very common uh, for lay people to refer to all of their blood vessels as veins. And hopefully by now you certainly appreciate that not all of your blood vessels fall into the vein category. So be sure you don't make that mistake when you are um, discussing veins from an anatomy and physiology or a clinical perspective. Veins are a particular type of blood vessel. All right, so blood that is has flown through a uh, capillary bed next moves into venules. Those are going to be your smallest veins. And the smallest venules are called the postcapillary venules like we were looking at on the last video lecture. These are actually very porous types of veins, so they themselves will take up surrounding fluids and even white blood cells um, can move in and out of the, the venules, which we'll talk about more about why that's important for white blood cells to be able to get into your tissues when we uh, study the immune system. That's important for their function and also for the process of inflammation. Venules are very tiny. The postcapillary venules, very thin, very tiny. They just have the endothelium, a single layer of cells with a few of those pericytes, the supporting cells that can surround the ones that form the, the walls. Those are your postcapillary venules lead to larger ones, um, which are still not large in the grand scheme of things. You're still down at the microscopic level, but there they can have one or two layers of smooth muscle cells so they can want it being constricted or allowed to dilate as needed. All right, your venules are going to lead to veins. And as mentioned in earlier lecture, your lectures, your veins have thinner walls than arteries. Uh, they don't have as much smooth muscle uh, the lumens are larger. If you actually uh, did a dissection um, and could feel with your fingers arteries versus veins, it is very obvious your arteries are more elastic and much tougher in terms of their walls. And the walls of veins tend to be pretty squishy and and wiggly and and wimpy. It's it's very obvious when you're actually feeling them in a in the dissection. Your blood pressure is actually lower in veins than in arteries. So when you measure blood pressure or somebody tells you, hey, my blood pressure is 125 over 85, uh, that blood pressure value is being is arterial blood pressure. And we'll be talking a whole lot more about blood pressure um, later. Inject your blood pressure is highest near the heart, and it's at its, at its lowest as you get back to the heart at the right atrium, that deoxygenated blood coming back to the right atrium. And if you think about it, that makes sense. You want the height, since blood has to flow in one direction like that from the heart through the systemic circulation and back to the heart, you want it to be highest over here at this end and largest or and lowest as you uh, get back to the, the heart itself. All right, and we've already taken a look at how the tunica media of veins is thinner than it is with arteries, um, but they do have a thick tunica externa where you have, that's the connective tissue outer layer of the wall with lots of elastic, uh, uh, lots of collagen fibers and also some elastic fibers in there as well. Sometimes your veins are called capacitance vessels like capacity, and they're essentially blood reservoirs. So at any given moment, um, up to 65% of your body's blood supply, you know, which is generally over five liters, uh, is present in your veins, believe it or not. And those blood vessels that are carrying the blood on its way back to the back to the heart. This is actually a pie chart from your textbook, which shows you at any given moment on average, you know, where is your blood located? And uh, interestingly enough, up to 65%, but more typically it might be about 60% located in the systemic veins. Only about 15% in systemic arteries and arterioles. And actually at any given moment, only about 5% of your blood is located in those capillaries or capillary beds that we were taking a look at. 8% 
in the heart and the pulmonary circulation at any given moment has about 12% of your uh, blood capacity. Okay, table 19.1. We've taken a look at part of this before when we were um, looking at the differences between the different kinds of arteries that exist in the body. And this is just giving you uh, diameter and wall thickness values for comparing a typical capillary in the body, very thin um, venules, also very thin. So the thickness of the wall is one micrometer. Um, that's super, super thin. That's one one millionth of a meter. And then when you get to your veins, the diameter of the lumen in an average vein is going to be five millimeters across. And um, that's about uh, five millimeters. You know, that's about a quarter of an inch in an average vein. So that's still pretty small. The wall thickness is about a half a millimeter. So your average vein, the wall thickness is not very, all those layers we were taking a look at there, that's only a half a millimeter, which is, you know, that's getting down pretty close to the width of a piece of paper. That's pretty, pretty small. All right, veins, the properties of veins are such that they help ensure the return of blood to the heart in spite of the low pressure. You don't have a lot of pressure in the veins. They have these very squishy, floppy walls, and there's not a lot of pressure in there that's helping to squeeze blood back toward the heart. Now you think about it, um, think about the blood that's coming back from your legs, for example, and it's having to flow back to the right atrium of the heart. It's got to get emptied into the inferior vena cava so that blood vessel can bring that blood back to the heart. There's not a lot of pressure in those blood vessels. So how in the world do we get that blood back to the heart if you have such low blood pressure because gravity is going to be fighting against it. A couple, few things help out with this. Um, one is that the lumens have very large diameters. The walls are very thin. So that, that you remember we were talking about if the diameter is bigger, blood flows more easily through larger diameter uh, vessels than smaller diameter vessels. There's less resistance to that flow. Veins also have valves in them. So if we have a vein here, a valve consists of a couple of different flaps. So let's say this is a vein down in your leg. Blood is moving this way, upward, against gravity, back toward your heart. These little valve flaps you have right there help prevent backflow. You know, the blood's going to try to fall due to gravity. And those valves, if they're closed, help uh, help catch that blood. And that also helps move it back towards the heart. Valves are most abundant in the veins of your arms and your legs. Then there are also uh, veins called sinus sinuses. It's not the same as a sinusoid capillary. These are um, thicker, flatter veins uh, with extremely thin walls. And that includes the coronary sinus of the heart. So we've studied that one already as part of your coronary circulation. And then you also have a big um, sinus in the brain called the dural sinus that collects deoxygenated blood off of the off of the vein as well. Off of the brain, not the vein, off of the brain. Okay, another feature I want to uh, mention about blood vessels before we conclude sort of this intro on all the properties and the features of blood vessels are vascular anastomoses that's plural anastomosis with an i would be the singular form of an uh, of anastomoses now we mentioned these before when we were taking a look at the coronary circulation and the little small blood vessels that extend through the myocardium supply the wall of the heart itself with blood, you have a lot of interconnections between arteries in there. And um, those were an example of anastomoses. But you have them in other locations of the body. They're basically um, artery or vein networks, depending on whether you're looking at an arterial anastomosis or a venous anastomosis. And um, here's a pretty good visual of one. You have anastomoses 
along your vertebral column, along your vertebrae. So you have arteries that are supplying blood to the vertebrae. Remember, bones have a good blood supply. And those arteries exist in a network, like you see there. So, you know, blood that's passing through these anastomoses can take different routes and help supply different tissue locations where they exist. Those alternative paths within that next network are sometimes called collateral channels. Where do you have these anastomoses? You don't have them everywhere in the body. They are, um, you commonly have them in your joints, your abdominal organs have them, the heart like we've already talked about, you have them in the brain. Um, and in the heart, you know, we mentioned it's very good to have these anastomoses in the heart because if you wind up with a blockage in a, in a relatively small artery within the wall of the heart itself, if the blood has alternative ways of flowing around that blockage, then you don't cut off the blood supply to uh, vital areas of the heart wall. Same thing in the brain. Let's say you wind up with a thrombus in a small artery in the brain. If the blood has alternative ways to flow around that thrombus through the artery network, you're not going to cut off the uh, supply of oxygenated blood to a particular area of the brain. So that winds up being a, generally winds up being a very good thing. Okay, so uh, those first four lectures conclude sort of our background information on blood vessels. The probably the key topic uh, as far as physiology for chapter 19 is blood pressure. And some of this information I'm going to be pulling back out of chapter 18, and um, but much of it will be new here. One of the things that heavily influences the blood pressure in our body is cardiac output, and I, you know, I emphasized when we did chapter 18 that was a really super important topic. Now here we will get a whole lot more into how the body regulates and controls blood pressure, which is absolutely essential to you staying alive because proper blood pressure is needed to ensure circulation of the blood to all of your major organs and when your blood pressure fails you can't survive for very long because the blood supply winds up getting cut off to uh, vital areas of the body. Also here as you guys know your blood pressure is not good for your blood pressure to be too high either because that can lead to things like your blood vessels bursting and that can wind up uh, causing death as well. So blood pressure is an extremely important topic and we will spend quite a bit of time um, talking about how the body controls it and homeostatic imbalances and uh, you know what happens if your blood pressure drops um, too low or too high and how that uh, impacts health.